Okay, we want to welcome everybody here today to uh, certification. Everybody at home, too, welcome. Uh, we're going to go over today's certification. It's the first part of this. Uh, that's certifying players and coaches and teams. And the second part's going to be how to use Infinity. So uh, we're going to have somebody come up here. I will be up here to talk about that. But Jamie and I, if uh, everybody remembers Jamie and I, uh, we're going to be talking, playing tag team today certification so we're going to start out we're going to have a powerpoint up here today and well we're going to i think we're going to have this put on the mid america website so that way everybody can uh, access it and if you want copies i think jamie can get you copies too okay okay moving on so the first part of our certification, we want to talk about liability, and this is very important because uh, liability is what triggers to make sure everybody's certified. Uh, you're, you're, you're a liable person in Pop Warner. You've got a big job, so we want to make sure that all the documents are turned in, and that's because, again, it's all about liability. You have a big job. Assuming most of you are business managers, so you've got a big job to make sure that the certification book is put together, all the documents are in it and signed, and there's been times in the past where uh, liability took effect because, again, the birth certificate is a very important, the medical form is very important, the consent form is very important, and those are things that could fall back on us if they're not turned in or signed properly. Uh, there's been stories from other states that they uh, or organizations, associations have been sued because of things that fell back on and it all becomes a liability. So make sure of everything we talk about today uh, is, is right. Sign, documents are in the book, uh, players can't start without all of it, uh, coaches, the whole thing that we're going to talk about today is liability. Clicker's not working. Okay, uh, we'll catch up. So uh, the definition of certification is the act of being certified, uh, being vouched for guaranteed. And again, you'll get a copy of this, uh, and it's going to be on our website, so you can go through it uh, with your associations or leagues, which we really want you to do that because we're the ones that are coming in here to get trained, and we want you to go out and train because everybody's got to be on board. Uh, you know how coaches are. How many of you have already been business managers in the past? Now, you can't tell me that coaches are all about X's and O's, and they turn everything over to you and say, hey, here you go. Uh, you know, it's your, your deal. So uh, you guys need to go back and train them and let them know how important it is to make sure that all this stuff is done that we're turning in today. Okay, so definition of certification is certification in Pop Warner is a process whereby the team or association is filed with the league, a complete roster of player participants for the season. Certification will be accomplished with the team that assists the roster, which again, Ida is going to go over the roster software uh, after we're done. All rosters must be completed through Affinity software system prior to the first game of competition. So you cannot use anything as far as building rosters except for Infinity. All rosters must be approved by the league prior to association's first game in order to be able to print mandatory play sheets. So what that means is, is that once you complete a roster, everything's done on it and you upload it, that will create your mandatory play, play sheets for the game. There's no changes to be made once you upload it and it goes into the league level. So just make sure everything's right on, on the roster and uh, then the mandatory play sheets you can print for the game. Certification is traditional pop warner football. So there's, there's we got traditional pop warner, we got age-based pop warner, and then we got, of course, the other cheerleading, spirit and balloon. So traditional pop warner football is uh, must meet the age and weight requirements specified on the pop warner age and weight matrix. The age-based is must meet the age requirements specified on the pop warner age matrix. 
And then, of course, the Cheer and Dance must meet the age requirements specified on the Spirit Box 108 notice. Okay. Uh, Jamie, you want to take over the coaching? try and speak louder into the microphone and <laughs> yes I'm going to put a sign in sheet so at the very end if everybody wants to just come put their email down I will email the PowerPoint to everybody just to make sure they get it okay or, or you could well the power strip for that day and that's a complete different thing <laughs> any other questions about the, ser um, the testing the coaching requirements
unless you are rostered as something on a football or spirit roster. Okay. Um, age coaching requirements. Head coaches have to be 21 years of age. Assistant coaches must be 18. Um, one person per roster must hold CPR, first aid, attendant equipment. Yes, ma'am. can only be one head coach. Your head coach can only be rostered as the head coach of one team. They can be an assistant on another team, but they can only be the head coach of one team. Okay. Um, you can have, I want everybody to listen to this because we have a lot of trouble with this. Um, there are specific, the software will allow you to enter nine assistant coaches. Okay. We will not allow for coaches. If you read the rule book, it says you can have five assistant five assistants, you can have a trainer, a team parent, an equipment manager, and then you can have a coach assistant. There can be a total of 10 per roster. Here's the thing. Everybody has to take the same certifications regardless of what you are rostered as. I know sometimes it's an issue with the coaches because they all want to be assistant coaches. So the first five are assistants, everybody else is something else trainer, team parent, equipment manager, it doesn't matter. They're still on the sideline. They can still assess the kids. They can still talk to the kids and coach the kids because they're all certified as coaches anyway. Okay, but it has to be like that on the roster. Any questions about that? Thank you. Play counters. Want to talk about play counters? Yeah. <coughs> play counters are not check. Um, you can have two play counters per team. They are not required to be certified like your coaches because they are not actually listed on your roster. Um, if they Now sometimes you'll take a, a team parent and you'll make them a play counter, right? They're, they are the team parent. There's a badge that says team parent, but they're also going to play count. So what I'm talking about is they are only a play counter. They only have a badge for play counter and they are not listed on your roster. When they are done play counting, they leave the field. They are not allowed to stay on and coach because they are not certified as coaches. Their sole purpose is simply to play count. So make sure <laughs> that you don't have a dad that wants to play count because he wants to be on the sideline because once he's done play counting, he leaves the field. Or either way. <coughs> um, however, if you use like a team mom, she's rostered as your team mom on the roster and she also play counts for you, when she's done play counting, she comes right back to your sideline, or he comes right back to your sideline, and they can still put their badge on in their roster. Okay. Any other questions? Make sure your play counters get badges. Please try and find them before the season starts. It's very complicated for us on the sideline, trying to do sideline management, where we have 15 people out there, and eight of them say they're play counting, but none of them have a badge. questions about play counters? In the book, I do, I do not. Keep, I keep them in a file folder, and then I just, I keep them, make sure you keep them year after year after year, so you could see if somebody ever came back and said, make sure you keep the badge and check. Okay? Any other questions about play counters or anything so far? Okay, uh, Millie covered this a little bit, I think, this morning, but we'll go over it just a little bit. Um, rosters for cheer is not much different. Uh, we'll go over it. Uh, one head coach per roster must be 20 year, 21 years of age. Four assistant coaches at 18 years of age. A total of four student demo coach trainees combined. Um, student demo information is, uh, if you want to look in the book, uh, slide 11. Uh, coach training max three, so there's it's 16 to 17 years of age, so those are coach trainees. Um, 
some leagues require that the cheer director be all on the roster. Check with your league to make sure what they require. There can be a total of 10 administrators per team roster. So just like Jamie was saying, it's no different than football. Um, oh, you, Jamie, you need to go to the bathroom. Oh, okay. Um, so anyway, it's not much different than football and cheer. They're pretty much the same, except for you have like two administrators and I believe mascots for cheer. But everything as far as like how many you can have on the roster and, and everybody has to have a title, it's all the same. So uh, if you have any questions on the cheer roster side of it, uh, get with Millie or part of her cheer team and they'll help you out on that. But uh, yeah, as far as us teaching certification, the roster software is going to be pretty much the same and how to set it up for both. Okay, so building rosters, coach training, and student demonstrators were still in the cheer, required to have the same paperwork as a participant. Uh, so a participant is, is, we'll get to that for the newbies, but uh, you have to have the four documents that are in the book that are required uh, for a player. So it'd be the same thing as uh, for a student demonstrator. Required to have the same coaching certificate. So because they're underage, they have to have all the paperwork, but because they're gonna coach, they have to have coaching certificates just like our coach here. Uh, their paperwork goes after the last coach placed in the book. So once we get into how to set up a book, we'll show you where those go, um, but they go in right after the last coach's document. They do not count against your number allowed of coaches. So the student demonstrators are kind of like they are starting to learn how to coach. So they're not really coaches. So again, So there's a maximum of three coach trainees, okay? And, and then I don't know if we can go back, but it's 16 and 17 years old. So you can see it on that one. Uh, okay, so Bridget, can you answer this question? Yeah, because she's part of the chair. She's part of the chair. Okay, so uh, we'll get into building rosters for the student demonstrators. And again, this is all cheer. So uh, Bridget may have to help us out on this, but uh, must have two prior seasons of cheer and dance experience. Does not have to be with Pop Warner. A rostered cheer leader may serve as a student demo. Must work with younger teams. Oldest girl rostered must be two years younger than the student demo. Must be under the direct supervision of the head coach must be rostered as part of the coaching staff. Um, now again, if you have questions on this, we're just kind of going over it with you, but Millie's gonna be here all day and she can answer any questions you have about cheer. We just don't wanna step you know, out of bounds. Uh, we're just giving you information on this. But uh, again, I'm sure both of us, we don't wanna do the wrong information, but we should be out there. So. Yes. So we're right now we're talking about cheer. Um, in football, they have uh, they, they still you can still have 16 and 17 year olds um, helping, um, but they have to have the, all the paperwork also, and they're they're counted as coaches. So, yeah, yep, yep. Okay, so uh, we're gonna get into building of rosters. 
And the big question of, that we always hear about is water boys and water girls, and this is only for football, okay? Because cheer has a mascot. Um, but this is for water boy and water girl. So uh, what we're going to need for a water boy and water girl is an, uh, an ID card. So whenever your town or however you do your ID cards, which is the ones that get you on the field, or that I also have one, we'll get into that in a little bit, they have to have an ID card order to get on the field also. So the water boy and girl does not have to have documentation or the paperwork that a player does because they do not participate in practices or games. What they are is, is they're just supposed to be water boy and girl. So in practices or in games, they have the water and if there's a timeout, they run them out there or whatever the duties are. But, but again, they don't, they're not participating. They have to be have at least five. They have to be at least five years of age because that's the lowest age group in Pop Warner. Um, you can only have two per. You can only. <laughs> wow, didn't know my voice could do that. Um, you can only have a maximum of two per team, and they should be with the appropriate t team as far as age. So let's say, for instance, uh, you have a team of five and six-year-old tiny mites then your water boy or girl should be a five or six year old. Now, what's nice about this is, is it's, let's say for instance, a player just doesn't like football or they doesn't, you know, the, the parents are forcing them to play, but you, the parents want to keep them involved. This is a good way to do it. They can still be in Pop Warner. They can still be out at practices. They can still be at the games, but they don't have to go through, you know, the, the, pro, the, the the football part, you know, the tackling and drills and all that stuff. So keep that in mind, but we've had in the past, and the reason we changed this rule is because we had some people that brought their grandparents in that wanted to be water boy and girls only because they wanted to get on the field. So we had to put this in place to make sure that we were following, you know, the age group. Yes? Uh, that's something that what you need to do is get with your league because sometimes when sometimes we do let maybe a game or two but uh, that'll be up to your league but we again just like the sure has said people abuse this and we have to keep control of it because you know, everybody wants on the field for sure so okay moving along Okay, so I'm getting back into cheer again. I'm just going to read this off. So building rosters, mascots, which is, which is spirit only. Uh, mascots are at the discretion of the league. Mascots must be certified just like a participant. So, again, these aren't water boys. These are mascots, so they have to have the paperwork. Uh, no trials for mascots. A participant can only be uh, the mascot for one team. A participant may only be rostered as a mascot if they are not old enough to be certified. Here's my voice again. I got a vibrator on my throat. Um, a participant may be rostered as a mascot. Okay. No, that's fine. Uh, and you can actually, you can read it up there. So if you have any questions on this, again, get with Millie or one of the girls because they can answer for sure. All right, we just had to add it in the presentation. Okay, Jamie, you ready? All right, registration of the participants. A player cannot begin practice with a team until he or she has officially registered with a Pop Warner team. All participants must furnish the following in order to be registered and begin practicing, and all the documents must be 100% complete. The documents required are they have to have proof of age, they have to have a medical examination, a medical history form, the COVID form, your parental consent and the contract signed by both parent and child, and scholastic fitness. In general, about those basic things, does anybody have any basic questions about that? Uh, they have the report card. Report card, homeschool report. <sighs> I love you. 
<laughs> I know. <I'm laughs> All right, so the next slide's gonna talk about um, proof of age and what constitutes proof of age, what you can turn in for proof of age. So a certified copy of your birth certificate bearing the seal of the issuing office of the state of birth. This may not be altered and it must be clearly readable, okay? Um, a current passport will be accepted. A current military ID, if your kid is, has a military family and they have a military ID, that'll be accepted as a proof of age. The other thing that we'll accept for proof of age this year is a state, a government issued photo ID, like from the BMV, right? That can also um, be put in place of a birth certificate. Um, the hospital birth certificate with the cute little footprints on them and the little big gold seal thing, that is not acceptable. That's just a decorative certificate they give you to take home to put in the baby book. Anybody have any questions about proof of age? No, that's for future reference. Um, registration of participants, still kind of proof of age. We're gonna talk a little bit about adoption stuff, um, wards of the court, because they're a little more complicated. Um, adoption, if the child is adopted and a name change has occurred before the start of the season, and before there is a new birth certificate, place the copy of the court order behind the old birth certificate in the binder. Okay. Sometimes they're gonna get a copy of the court order way before they're gonna get a copy of a new birth certificate. Okay, so if there's a court order, I'm gonna take that for what it is. It's a court order um, and we're gonna take that. Uh, all paperwork should match the court order. Okay. It should be about three, it should be about three pages long. A custody order is about three pages long. Yes, ma'am. Same thing. Um, if they are, have a guard, if they have a guardian, the guardianship papers needs to be in the book as well. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the guardians are going to match the same last name as the student either. More about what we're talking about for this is like the kids who have a birth, just a birth certificate that has one name, and they have something else that says a different name that are from a court. But same thing. Guardianship papers are the same. They're court. They're pretty much a court order also. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now has to be there. I need to see the ID. Um, court documents that provide proof of age for children in foster care or wards of the court will be acceptable if a birth certificate is not available. Sometimes for wards of the court, um, children in foster care, they just, they don't have access to their birth certificate. They just don't have it. So if that's the case and you have some questions about it, please just reach out to me and we'll talk more about it one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't happen all that often. Um, medical exams. Mm, physicals are good for 365 days from the date they are signed by a licensed doctor or practitioner. It must be signed and dated with the information filled in that little bottom doctor section or have a stamp with the doctor's name, address, and phone number and their license number. Okay, either one. They can either fill it out. Most doctor's offices use stamps. The doctor actually has to sign the physical though but like where the information to fill his stuff in, a stamp is fine, but it needs to be filled in. I don't, I don't just want like some random signature that I can't read, that I can't verify to anything. It needs to have an office address phone number, okay? Yes, ma'am. ma'am the physical the physical itself somewhere on that physical form it it has to say that they are eligible to play some kind of phys they're eligible to participate in some kind of physical activity people try and bring wellness checks every once in a while and those just don't say anything about whether or not the child the child is actually able to play okay so I need a document sign so the I like your state physical form like the Indiana ones the IHSAA form but your state physical form would be perfect. Otherwise, I recommend using the Pop Warner physical because those other ones, sometimes they just don't have all the right information on them. And I know it's a pain to get the parents to take them back and get something different because nobody wants to do that because we have to spend more money for it. But just try and encourage them to use either the state physical form or the Pop Warner form. Any questions about that? Okay. <sighs> That's a good thing. 
right? So I guess if you're going in for a wellness check, Right, 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 right. Perfect, perfect. Um, the medical history form, it needs to be completed in its entirety by their parent or guardian. Um, it must be signed and dated by the parent or guardian. And please, please try and make sure they provide the insurance information. I know some parents give some serious pushback about insurance information. Please try and get it. Okay. COVID forms. I haven't really got any directions 100% one way or the other that we're going to use these this year. I'm going to assume that we're still going to use these for the year. Yes, ma'am. Write an A on it. Yes. If they refuse, they just flat out refuse to give you the insurance information, just write NA. It goes, it falls back on their insurance pr as the primary first. Um, we just like to have it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to say for as of, as of right now, COVID forms are required until further notice. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, form, the form is to be filled out at like your first camp, the first practice, and then the start of the season. Right? For everything that starts new, they need a new one. So we start conditioning, fine. When we get to, we start conditioning in practice, they need one. First game, they need another one. Competition, they need another one. Yes, coaches also need to have COVID. Yes, coaches also need to have COVID forms in the binders behind their certificates. Yeah, you're probably going to end up with three or four per person per season. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, I would have them sign another one. I, honestly, if I were going to do it, I would have them sign them once every two or three weeks just to make sure I'm covering myself and make at practice. At practice. <laughs> Have the team mom go around and find all the parents and have them fill it out again. Like that's what I that's what I used to do. Um, it's just more of a cover your own butt kind of thing, so we can say that we are actively working to prevent COVID. Okay. Any other questions about that form? Okay. <coughs> the registration of participants, the parent contract and consent, it needs to be filled out by the parent and or the guardian. If grandma comes and signs up kid, I would prefer that mom or guardian or whoever has legal authority over the child come sign them up because otherwise, so the grandma signs them up because the grandma wants them to cheer. Well, if, what if the mom doesn't want them to? Right? So just make sure it's the parent or the guardian that signs them up, fills out the paperwork, signs the forms, says that they're allowed to play um, because it's stating that the parent or guardian is giving permission for that child to participate. Um, the child signature is the same. It needs to be on there. It needs to be scribbled, scratched in by the kid. If they're five, chicken scratch works. But it's just saying that they are willing to participate in playing as well, participating. Okay. Um, electronic signatures, if you're doing online registrations, those will be accepted as well, though. Um, and forms, they just need to be completed in their entirety. Please, if there's illnesses or whatever, make sure that they are listed and documented. Any questions about that? All right, so we're going to talk about scholastic fitness. Um, so report cards <laughs> need to have the name of the child. They need to have a grade for every class that they are in. They need to have the name of the school, the school year, and the current grade of your child. Last year was very complicated for report cards. Uh, hopefully this year is not going to be so complicated for report cards. Does anybody have any questions about report cards in general? They're going to do a whole scholastic workshop and session so if you have any specific questions Patty is a much better person to answer them <laughs> yes somewhere I get to that too right all right she said to um, if they didn't have a report card to put an eligibility form in 
I'm going to talk about that in just a minute or two. Um, okay, so proof of satisfactory progress in school is required. So a 2.0 or 70% or the equivalent shall be the minimum GPA. Homeschooling. Um, they must complete a homeschool form and provide a, progress, a progressing progress report or report card form from an accredited governing body to continue play after October 15th. That report, and this is huge, <laughs> that report must be dated between September 1st and October 15th. If it is not, it is not valid and your child is no longer eligible to participate. Mm -hmm. September 1st through October 15th for any kind of progress report that has to go in. Um, the preschool form, if they were in preschool and they're just going into kindergarten, so they don't have a report card, there's a preschool form. Um, it's on, <coughs> you can just print that off, have them fill it, have the parent fill it out and that'll uh, work for the report card. Questions about that? Still fill out one of the preschool forms. Just says they're, like if the parent did it, at, like they kind of did it at home instead of actually sending them to preschool, same thing. Just if they haven't hit kindergarten yet, they need to fill out a preschool form, okay? Um, okay, so we'll talk about eligibility, scholastic eligibility a little bit. So if you have a kid who brings a report card and the GPA is below 70% or they don't have a report card to submit, you can submit a scholastic eligibility form. If you submit one of those forms in place of a report card, that's where the progress report comes in, you have to have a progress report dated between September 1st and October 15th placed on top of the scholastic eligibility form. If the form is not dated between those date ranges, your kid is no longer eligible to play. And please don't explain that to your parents because they're gonna be very upset with you. <sighs> Any questions about that? Okay, we're gonna talk about roster sizes. For football, no more than 35 players shall be assigned to any football team at the start of preconditioning. A minimum of 16 players must be dressed and eligible to start every game. And if you start the game with your 16 players, you can finish the game with 15 eligible players. Um, spirit and dance, uh, it just, the only thing it said in there was that no more than 35 participants shall be assigned to any spirit dance team at the start of the preconditioning. Any questions about roster sizes? Sir? Yes, sir. Tiny mites sometimes have a different, uh, the eight man football has different maximums. Um, I think it's 18. I should change that to 11 man football versus eight man. Correct, thank you. <laughs> okay, drops and adds to your roster. A team may add participants to its certified roster as long as a roster was certified below the maximum number permitted or to replace those originally certified but no longer on the team for a valid reason. Each league shall create their own add drop cutoff date but no no player, spirit participant, or coach may be added to any roster after the first Monday in October of the current year. Also, all teams must have an active status in the roster software system by the first game in order to be able to print mandatory play sheets. So that's pretty much football oriented, right? So it has to be active in order to be able to print a play sheet. And play sheets need to be printed in jersey number order not by last name it is i do play counting for the region during playoffs and it is impossible to try and look them by name <laughs> when you don't know who the kids are right it is so much simpler to just use it by ross by jersey number so please when you print them print them in jersey number any questions about that okay certification photo id cards all rostered administrators and participants are required to have a photo ID card. Um, cards should include your picture, name, date of birth, town, team, name, and current year for the players. Cards should include picture, name, title that matches the roster, town, team name, and current year for the administrators roster, or for your rostered administrators. And cards should include picture, name, board member, title, town, and current year for your board members. 
So your board needs badges, your coaches need badges, your players need badges, your play counters need badges, your water girls and boys need badges, everybody needs badges. Players will not be allowed to participate in games or competitions without a photo ID card. Coaches are the same. They will not be allowed on the field or backstage without a photo ID card. Yes, ma'am. Ryan. ID cards must be done under the supervision of the league just to help ensure league consistency. We just want it to be consistent across the board, everybody to have the same matching stuff. It is imperative that the player information on the photo ID card match the roster, match your birth certificate. Everything has to match. Any, the, the date of birth has to be correct. The way it's spelled has to be correct on all of the forms. It should be uniform all the way across. We were at regional playoffs last year and we still had kids with the wrong ID cards, didn't have the right date of birth, didn't have the names are spelled wrong. So please, 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 when fo wh whoever does your ID cards, when they give them back to you to hand out, make your business managers look through them to make sure that they match the roster, the names are spelled correctly, the date of birth the right. Um, same thing. Oh, and it has to be legal names on their ID cards because it's legal names on their birth certificate, no nicknames, okay? Um, if a coach is rostered on more than one team, if he's the head coach on this team and he's the assistant coach on these other three teams, he needs a badge for each team that he coaches. Right, because each bat because he's rostered on different rosters and his badge has to match the roster. So if he's listed as the head coach on the eight U team, then his eight U badge should say head coach. If he's listed as an assistant on the ten U team, his ten U badge should say that he's an assistant coach. Right. If we can discuss that, our the way we print ours, they don't do them like that, but we could talk about that. If you can put them all on one badge and it. Let's talk about that after the meeting, okay? Sure. Any other, uh, any other things about the photo ID cards? Yes, ma'am. No, your cheer coordinator badge will be sufficient. Yes, ma'am. requires her to be on the roster if Robin requires that you are rostered on all the rosters because you're the cheer coordinator um, I would ask her because that's a league that's a league thing okay any other questions about that okay Okay, so uh, tell you what, Kelly, hold up that, Kelly, hold up your binder right there, would you? Okay, so if everybody, anybody that did not put together a binder last year, this is what we're talking about right here. It's a three ring binder. Um, this is what everybody uses, depending on what size of a team you have, you can get big ones, small ones. One thing that happened uh, years ago is, as we were up here and we had a, um, one of those little, like, uh, 
one three page or four page folder you know the paper ones with the little clip things that you put and I said okay everybody has to have one of these in the book well we had a team come with everybody had one of those and I had a stack of them like this so I want to make sure that everybody's seen that three ring binder because I didn't want to go through each one of them books again and make you go through it so uh, three ring binders what we're talking about all right so put together a binder how come that never happened to you Okay, so uh, so each team has to have their own binder. So if you have a junior peewee, a peewee, you have a, a tiny mite, whatever, each of them has to have their own binder. Uh, e okay, so each document has to be in a plastic sleeve. Uh, does anybody not know what I mean by plastic sleeves? You can buy them anywhere. You can buy them at Walmart, you can get them at Staples, whatever. But those are what protect, we call them sleeve protectors. That's what protects your documents. Uh, each player has to have a tab for their paperwork for qu quick reference. So for us to look us up a name or you to look up a name, the little tabs on the, uh, I don't know, the packet, you can see their name on it and you can flip through and say, oh, there's Johnny right there, okay? So right now, this is what we're doing. We're putting together the packet or the binder. So to start with the documents, and each document, again, must have the plastic sleeve. So we start with the team roster that you print off from Infinity. That's the first document in there. And like Jamie said, it all has to be in, in roster order. So when we start with A's and end with Z's, that's what the book should look like. You should start with the first child with A and end with the last child with Z, all right? We can't mix it up. Now, one thing I do want to tell you is, is we've for years, we've played with this and tried to make it as simple as possible, and this is the best because it makes it easier for you guys, it makes it easier for us, and that way when we go through your books or you go through the books, uh, you go through it with, with ease, so it's not difficult. After the team roster, you flip the page over. The next one is the coach's certificates. So the coach's certificate should start with the head coach because he's first on the roster. And then you go next, 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 all the way down through your 10 if you have 10 coaches. So that way when you're looking at the roster, if you pull it out, you're going, there's James, there's Joe, there's Cindy or whatever, and you're looking right through their uh, certificates. So that way everything's in order. Uh, the next one after that is the coach trainees or student demonstrators that we talked about earlier, which I apologize for that. Uh, again, we just do certification I'm not a cheer expert, so I couldn't even tell you what a chair or whatever that stuff is in cheer, but uh, if you have any questions on that, get with Millie today or one of the cheerleaders. Yeah, the coach trainees, that would the yep, after the certificate. So once the coach packets are done, so that you've got, so let's start over. So we go, first of all, roster. Well, there's the head coach certificate. There's the next coach. And, and again, you got a Mid-America certificate, you got the USA certificate, so we want to put the Mid-America on top USA on the back, is that how you want to do it? And then, uh, and then you flip the page, and then you're, there's your first assistant coach, there's your second assistant coach, then you keep going, you know, if you have 10 of them, you should have 10 in a row, okay? So that's that part. Then you come up, and again, this is for cheer only, then you got your student demonstrators, or your coach trainees paperwork and certificates next. So they should follow in order, all right? So then um, uh, the participant documents is next, so you have four documents that you're gonna put in there. So let's start with the first one. Uh, first child on the roster is A. So we'll call him Adam, blah, blah, blah. So his last name's Adams. His first document that I'm gonna look at is his first certificate, okay? That's the first one. You flip the next one, the next document's gonna be the medical form. If you're using, sometimes you have the IHSA, IHSAA forms there could be five of them we want to see the, the parts that show us that he got checked blood pressure and all that and we want to see the doctor's signature if there's other things in there in order put them all in there because we will pull them out and look at them sometimes the doctor will sign the second page and, and or it might be on the last page or whatever it's your job and our job to make sure that that stuff is signed and dated okay next paper uh, it's going to be uh, the national form. It's going to be the consent form, and it's going to be the uh, contract form. So the contract form is where the parents fill it out saying, I'm signing my child up for Pop Warner. All has to be signed and dated. 
put that in the sleeve on the back of the sleeve so when we flip it over, the next one's the consent form, okay? The consent form is saying my child can play and, and there's other things on there if you read it, but they're signing off, the child signs off. Now, there's questions about if a five-year-old can sign their name, should they sign it? If, as long as the parents sign it or have them put an X on there or whatever, you know, the child, they like writing their names. It's funny to look at them. If they can do it, let them do it, okay? And then the last thing is uh, scholastic eligibility. That would be the fourth packet. So, um, and that's part of the national form too, uh, possibly. I mean, you, you, if you have to use the eligibility form, you get that from the national website. But if not, it's a report card. So let's back up. Okay, first one, birth certificate, turn. Second one, medical release form, both sides, possible. Third is consent and uh, contract, front, back. Last, scholastic. That's one child. Flip, flip the packet over, now you're ready to do the next one. Follow in roster order, yes. COVID paper goes in right after the physical, okay? Again, we just started that last year, so it's a little new for us, yeah. Um, hopefully we won't have to do that next year, but again, we just follow suit. Any questions on that binder? Yes. On the contract? It's fine, as long as they sign it. Now, there's, now you gotta remember, there's a name, there's a top, it says name, make sure they fill the name in of the child because sometimes when you chicken scratch, you can't read. So the child's name has to be the top, the parent signs the bottom, of course you know that schools aren't teaching cursive anymore, so it's just a name, okay? All, we're, all we are interested in really is the parent's signature, because they're signing off consent. Now, the next thing is something that we started years ago that was questioned us, and that is highlighting certain, certain items on the papers. For the ones that did books, last year or years past, isn't that much easier for the yellow highlighting? Because you can look right at what you're looking for and you don't have to look for it because sometimes the doctor's signature could be up here, could be down here. Uh, I've looked at birth certificates many a times and they have the name of the father. Sometimes I took the wrong birth date, you know. Again, you always wanna double check the highlighted stuff. Don't go by what's been highlighted because that, you know, even the whoever highlights it could make mistakes. But So what we wanna do is starting with the birth certificate, proof of age, uh, we want you to highlight the name and the date of birth. Those are the two importance to us. Medical history form, you wanna do the parent's name? Yes. Not on the original birth certificate, no. And we'll get into that here in a minute about birth certificate. Uh, medical history, physical history, you want to highlight the parent's name and date. You, on the physical, you want to highlight the doctor's name, stamp, and date, or stamp. That's what we're looking for. Now, if there's other things you want to highlight that is important to you, go for it, but that's what we want. And then the COVID form, make sure you got the parent's child, or parent and child signature and date on that. Any questions? Okay, now again, we're building this book now. So now you just highlighted everything that needs to be looked at and a purpose of our level and even your level. And if you wanna highlight more, you can, okay? Uh, the parent contract, make sure you, the parent guardian name is the, in the uh, name in the middle of the form. Uh, participant name at the top of the form, and I think we just talked about this, parent guardian signature date, child signature if they can sign it. On the scholastic part of it, the, the participant name, the current grade and name of school and the school year, those have to be highlighted. Because when Patty looks at, the, at the, the, the report cards, she wants to know all that information, she needs it, and so do we. Okay, um, Jamie, you wanna do the next one? Steps in certifying your team. Hold the sign up <laughs> and collect required documents. Huh? I know. 
before Bill comes up and pushes it towards my face again. Hold your sign-ups, collect your required documents, highlight the specific items specified by the region and anything else that you find important. Um, create your teams, enter the participants and the administrators, and enter their information into the roster software. Once the team is created, print your roster, put it in the first sleeve of the certification book. Next, place the coaches in the book in roster order. We kind of just went over, I mean, Brian just kind of talked through this. Um, and then, so coaches, they go in that order, the spirit book, only after last coaches with the Waikato projection sheets, that's the difference. And then place the participants in the book in roster order and document order as required by national. So it's just what we, what Brian literally just went over. This is just more wordy. <laughs> um, any questions about how this, but this is really just. Okay. We're gonna talk about, oops. We're just gonna talk about a little bit of Jersey stuff. Jersey requirements. You have to get approval for your Jersey. Jersey mock-ups must be sent to Larry Babcock on the Mid-America Regional Board for approval before you purchase them. Do not buy your jerseys if you haven't got them approved um, because it will really stink if they're not legal and you won't be able to use them. Yes, ma'am. I would send them just to make sure he thinks that they're legal. Yes, ma'am. Illegal uniforms won't be approved, and once approval is given, then you should order your uniform. I mean, I ordered mine through P PW Authentic for my town, and I still sent the mock-up to Babcock just to get it approved. So I had it in writing that it was okay. Okay. Jersey requirements as it pertains to certification. The player must bring to certification a home and an away jersey that meets Federation M Top Warner guidelines. So when they come to certification, they should be in their jerseys. Okay. Patch placements. Football, the top of the patch should be on the line between the v-neck and the sleeve on the left side of the jersey. Information, Top Warner Authentic is the only company allowed to sublimate patches. Patch order forms are also found on the Top Warner website. You do get a discount if you buy Pop Warner patches before July 1st, it's like 10% off. Um, just for your own information. Um, tier, uh, the top needs to, uh, patch needs to be two inches from the bottom of the skirt or sweater toward the left front. And if it's on the bottom, it's two inches from the bottom entered on the middle of the left leg of the skirt. There's uh, some, the next screen will have examples so you could see them. Okay. Helmet certification. Football helmets must be less than 10 years old. Helmets for the 2021 season to be um, to be in certification to be what's the word I'm looking for? valid. Um, they must have a 2019, 20, or 21 Noxie sticker on them. Okay. If if they have a 2018 sticker, they are not that helmet. You can't use it this year. Helmets must be recertified and, re or re and or reconditioned every two years. Okay. Many manufacturers have set the reconditioning cycle at every two years. After every second season, the helmet needs to be recertified and reconditioned again by an authorized reconditioner recertifier. There are over 20 which belong to the National Athletic Equipment Reconditioner Association. Um, and then the next one just talks about the sticker and um, who does it and why. Just, it's just um, some general information. We're gonna talk about background checks because these are important. Background check, who gets them? All rostered personnel get them. Everybody on your roster should have a background check. Your play counters need a background check. Um, board members need background checks. If you have volunteers that are not necessarily on your board but they are consistently volunteering and helping out, if I were you, I would do a background check. Like if you have one random parent that one time decides they're gonna help in the concession stand, okay, you don't need to do a background check on them. But if you have a parent that literally volunteers but they're not on your board every game and they're in contact with your kids constantly, I would background check them just to cover your own. Better safe than sorry. Um, they must have a background check prior uh, completed prior to assuming any kind of duties or having contact with the minors for the season. Um, a list of vendors for background checks uh, is on the national website. 
and so is the volunteer application. You can print it off the national website. Um, these are required. There is no exception, none, to this rule. Uh, it's, it's a huge liability issue. Yes, ma'am. Right, so the volunteer application on the, we on the website, on the Pop Warner website, it definitely requires their name, date of birth, social security number, driver's license number, and then it kind of talks, has like ge some general questions about have they ever coached before, do they have any CPR training, like have they ever been convicted of a felony, there's those kind of questions, and then on the back side of it, um, there's a place for references, and then they have to sign it that gives you permission to run their information. Any other questions about background checks for now? Okay. CPR and first aid. All practices and games must be attended by one person holding a Red Cross CPR and first aid certificate or the prepare course by the National Center for Sports Safety or an equivalent. Police officers, EMTs, paramedics, firemen, first responders, physicians, nurses, just if you have parents that are, are willing to do that for you, great. Um, you don't necessarily have to pay somebody to come do it. If you have a, your team mom is a paramedic, perfect. If you, one of your parents of your kids is a paramedic and they're gonna volunteer to stay all day, fantastic. Any questions about that? Okay. I know event request forms, I feel like there's some issues going on with them, but I'm just gonna kinda talk through them. When you need to submit one, if your association is having something special some special event other than a traditional practice or game or competition, an event request form must be completed and submitted for like, if you're having a bake sale fundraiser, if you want it to be covered by your insurance, you need to fill out an event form. If you're gonna do a parade and you want the kids to make sure they're covered in case whatever, there's some crazy accident, somebody falls off a float, whatever, make sure you turn in an event form. The event form The event form absolutely um, covers you on the insurance portion, okay? Um, who do you submit it to? The form should be submitted to the association president who will then submit it to the league president <laughs> who will then submit it to the regional board who will forward it to the national office. And then you will get an approval or a denial, okay? If you do not get an approval back, it's not approved. So make sure you have it, okay? Um, why is it important? It's a huge liability. I mean, that's the biggest reason. It's a liability issue. If you don't fill out an event request form, your insurance is not gonna cover it if it's not a traditional, normal um, uh, things that happen during the season. Any questions about the request forms? Yes, ma'am. Um, I would try and do them at least two weeks in advance because they have to go through a few different people to get back to you. So the, the earlier you can do them, the better. Like if you know what you're doing, you have it planned out for all year, do an event form and turn them in and get them back. No, I, no, I understand. Completely. I understand. Yep. One issue is COVID circumstances. By that I mean during the ascension is a picture of studs out of the game. This substitution had been a from your bench. And that sometimes is just like uh, a token some of the some of the uh, starting players get it. Some are taken out. Right. So, so what Jim's talking about there, guys, is get your mandatory play kids in, okay? We, we all know, and we're not naive to this, that you're going to have your starters and then you're going to have your bench, okay? When you put a team on the clock, try and get your bench in. Let those kids play. Think about how many snaps they truly get to play when you're in a tight game versus in a blowout. Let those kids get on the field and have some fun. They paid the same amount of money as the studs did, right? Let them play. Let them have fun. Yes. Um, one thing that I kind of want to remind you is too, is I didn't sit there and make a moment. Yes, there's no blitzing when we're in the slaughter rule. Okay? Yes. No. Kickoffs and penalties do not count as plays. Okay? Sure, go ahead.
Sorry about the uh, break, Larry, in the agenda, but uh, we've got uh, a special presentation we need to do, and the gentleman drove in to, to take the presentation, and uh, we wanted to slip him in so he can get back on the road, but uh, this is why we're Pop Warner, what's happening next. Last year, we had a situation where some folks didn't follow the rules, and we were on top of it, the league got a hold of it, and we tucked the proper action. So what we're going to do today is get, award the national championship trophy and the regional trophy that was well earned to the team that did it right, the team that followed the rules, and we're going to correct the mistake that was made. If you're a cheater and Pop Warner, you're going down the road. This team here, this 14U team, was probably one of the best 14U teams I've seen in 45 years in Pop Warner. To win a national championship in Pop Warner, you've got to go through Florida. Bottom line. Florida's the bar, the standard. So whenever anybody asks me, I tell them, go to the Classic U. It's a little bit easier. As you can see, pay, um, just being aware, since I am a regional person, my view of the screens are going to be a little bit different. You're not going to be able to see everything that I see. So I just want to say that up front. When you're going to roster your, so your football players for the fall and cheer fall season, you want to make sure that the drop down says 2021 fall season. A lot of times people get in and they got the old year or they got the spring season. It's very nice and easy, little drop down, and you get to choose what you want. When people tell me I can't register anybody, it's usually because they didn't do the drop down. So it's a very simple fix. pick on a league. I'm going to pick on Chicagoland because that's where I'm from. So as everybody is new to the roster software, I tell this to everybody every year. The first thing you want to do is you want to go to your security tab and you want to see who has access to this software. People leave, people come, people go. Go in here and remove anyone who does not need to have access. Where did I go? Okay, so I picked um, the league, and then when I showed up, I hit the security tab on the top. Do you see the tab on the top when you look to the right? So when you're saying that they don't have that, are you saying the association level? I'm going to show you the association level. The classic view is the old webs is the old way of the format. The new way that they did, they wanted to make the website very easy to see how many teams, how many players, but it's very heavy with the graphics, so it runs very slow. So whenever you go in and add somebody and you hit enter, you're waiting for that to process and do the loading. So the classic view is the old website. Showed okay. It says classic view to the right. Do you see the classic view? Yeah. It says it right there on there. It says classic view, so you click there and that's what it brings you to. I'm so glad that the computer's in front of me and you can't see me, so I'm too short. All right, so I'm so here I picked an association. So here's my association view, but do you see here's my security tab right here? Does everybody see that? Okay, so I picked an association. I picked Hoffman Estates. And what it's doing is on the right hand screen, it's showing me the association configuration, the registration, and the security tab. 
And if you click on the security tab, it's going to tell you who's there and who has access to the roster software. This is where you at an association level should always check to make sure that people who have left the association, because you know, presidents come and go, people come and go, roster software, people come and go. You want to limit the access to the people who have access to all this information, and this is where you would do it. This is also where you would be adding people, and in the book that we handed out the binder, there was a section that says add people. Did you guys all get a binder? No? upload these documents they're going to be available on a Google Doc and in here it gives you to walk you through the security section which is what I'm discussing how to make sure that people you can remove their access and then how to add administrators how to add participants in this book is um, PDFs on how to do all that and they said they're going to make that available on a Google Drive so that you guys could go up pull down the documents but I can show you also how to get it on the website You ask me, the only <laughs> I'm going to be honest, the only people that should have access to the software are the people who are going to be doing the rosters. Okay? They, you know, your board members, um, the roster software person that you assign has full rights to everything. Your president of the league also has full rights when you add them. Your cheer commissioner and football commissioner have the right to help you register players. Okay, so you know when you're doing registration, if you don't do online registration, but I think Dix does online registrations now anyway. Everybody does it through there, correct? Sound familiar? Yes. Okay, so that that'll pull your information, and then you know sometimes you can have board members have it, but you can give them to view only, so they can go in, they can see stuff, but they can't change anything. But the president and the roster software person have full access. And when we're looking at the person here, you can see, let me pick somebody. I just want to show you where you can see their access. You're going to fill in this information from them, and on the bottom here, this is a section where you can enter if you want them to have access. You can say association view only, administrator. Administrator has full access. Just make sure you only check one box, please, because any box that you check, if you check both boxes, they're going to get the the highest level view. So just make sure that when you're checking the boxes and when you're adding stuff, you can create a username for them and then you can create a generic password that once they log in, they can change it. And to change your password, you can go to my account up here when they're logged in and they can make a change to their password once they log in the first time but you would have to send them an email with their username and password. It doesn't automatically send it out, okay? All right. Now, I'm gonna show you how to add, you wanna come down here for Teams. 
So everybody does this differently. I find that if you create your teams before you start registering your player, it's a little bit easier because when you are registering your players, you can assign them to the player pool. And if you have your team cut out, you can say that Timmy is gonna go on to my Mighty Might Blue team. And so as you're completing Timmy's registration, he will automatically show up on that team. So if you have an idea of how you wanna do your teams, that's good to know. You create your teams first, then you go in and start registering your players and assigning them that way. It makes it a little bit easier, whether it's football or cheer. I just find that it's much easier and it's less of a headache. Everybody agree? Those have done it before? Okay. The only thing that we found with this team create, you can create a bunch of teams, but I think one of the things that they uh, mentioned, the team create matrix, if you know what teams you want, you can create them all at once, but I believe that the roster software defaults to girls. So you have to go in and make sure you make those changes. Am I right? All right, let's see, should we try? Sure. Yes. Right, so if you know that you're gonna have five cheer teams or five football teams, if you know what your team counts are in the beginning, you can use this team create matrix and make them all at once. Or you can go in and create each team individually. I just wanna point out the things that you should look at when you're looking at the team create because of the way that it defaults. So if you see here, oh see, now they changed it to all genders. Because right here, it used to say girls all the time. So now they're saying all genders. And so if you want to use, so you can choose your team at the top here, age base, Bantam, Challenger, Junior Bantam, Junior Pee Wee. And let's go to Junior Pee Wee. So we can change our age level. Well, no, you can't change it, age. And you could type in how many it'll create the, the basics for you, and then you can go in and fine tune each team as you go. I don't wanna do it because I don't wanna create a new season. So the next thing you'd wanna do is your player, to add your players. So the first thing that they recommend, if your players are returning players, they prefer that you use the player lookup tool because that way you're pulling that player's history and you can see where that player's played, where that player's been. Okay, so if you use player lookup and you start putting in somebody's name and if they're in the database, they're gonna pull them up automatically and then you could just continue with that player. One of the things they want me to point out to you is there's a filter here for a disciplinary filter. So let's say you have a player, I'm gonna show you guys how to enter this information in if you have some information that you wanna follow the player, the coach, a parent you can go in here and make this notation and run this report, and this report will show you if someone has any disciplinary action against them, whether it is a game suspension, whether they had a concussion, whether they got banned, this report will help run that for you. I may have you come up and see if you can run the report, if you don't mind. I'm gonna show how to get there. I need to pull the player up. Do we know anybody playing that I can use as an example? D-E-A-N? T-E-R-R-A-N? I just wanna pull them up so I can show them where the disciplinary action is. What, and this is gonna be the same whether it's a coach, a player, whichever one that you have. As the association person, that would be, yes. Because you have to remember who has access to the roster software. If you are the roster person and administrator, 
they'll give you this information, you can enter it. The president can also enter it. Like I said, a football commissioner, they would be able to enter it because they'd be able to go in because they could also help you register. So it depends on what levels you give everybody and what they can do. And that's something you as an association want to discuss and say you're going to be in charge of this. Um, the key is that you have to run the report whenever you're going to be adding people to see if there's anything in there. And I was going to have Christy try to run the report because as a regional person, when I run it, I see everything. And I am not sure what access everybody will have. And I don't want to say, yes, you're going to have that access. And then you get there and you can't. Um, so we're going to pull him up. Yes, I believe that you can, because if you have access to that, as a league, you do have that right as the roster person. So as you can see here, I pulled up Darren, Taryn, did I say it right? Okay. And there is a tab that's called disciplinary. This is where you would enter it. Whether it's a parent, coach, child, it doesn't matter, and you're gonna pick new disciplinary. The only thing I want to tell you is they have a yellow card, a red card. Basically, this roster software was built for soccer. So if you have to look at it as a terminology that we're going to use, a yellow card is like a written warning. They wrote you up, you had a minor violation. A red card is used when someone gets ejected from the team. And then you have ban, suspension, and they also have, I'm going to show you the drop down, they also have if someone had a concussion. The key is, as you enter this information, it's very important that you run the report and see because you can say um, from what day, you know, the suspension started this day. If he's being suspended for a game, you could say when it ends, and then you could say one game suspension. You could type in if you're going to do a penalty, caution, concussion, and then your notation. The notes section is very important because that's going to help you follow it. And, you know, it's kind of like a digital history, so you don't have to worry that if you leave and you had the paperwork, nobody's going to know about this. It's, it's a trail that follows that person, whether it's a child, a, a coach, or a parent, that anybody can see and say, hey, look, this was an issue before. He's been warned, warned at once. That's something they're going to have to discuss. I'm as you're. I'm showing it to you because this is something that we came across and they wanted me to make sure I point it out. This is something that I think is very useful, but that as an each league is going to have to decide how they want to do it. If they want to, you know, they wanted me to show everybody how to do this because it's a good feature to use. But how are we going to, you know, each league has to decide how they want to do it. Who's going to be in charge? I believe you have league meetings. Yes, no. These things come up in the league meetings right so you're going to be informed you're going to know and then you can document it okay the other issues that we have is when you're doing a mascot or a coach trainee those are all and a coach trainee is now entered as a coach so they would not be considered a participant. But a mascot is entered as a participant. You're going to register. It's also in the documentation that I provided. Um, you're going to enter them as a participant. You're going to pretend you're adding them to the team. And then on their tab for player, when they're on the roster, does anybody have a roster done? Does anybody have a roster complete yet? Or did you start entering rosters for the 2021 season? She's on a roster. What team is she on? Tiny. Okay, let me see if I can. You said Tiny might cheer. Is the team in here already? Okay. I'm s do you mind if I use your team? Do you mind if I use your team as an example? Okay. I appreciate that because on the regional level, I don't have teams, so I need to have people let me use a team so I can demonstrate stuff. So here I'm going to do a team search. And this is what you can do also as an association. And this is what I was telling you about, Chrissy. You can actually run a report. And if you see up here in this section, the status. No status filter. If I want to use a drop down, and these, these are teams that need to be activated, 
You can run to Fort and filter by if your team has been activated. If it hasn't been activated, do you see where I'm at, Christy? Okay. Okay. So there is on this team lookup page, you can choose what team you want to print, but also in the up. No, it's under the team lookup page. There is a filter in the upper right hand corner that you can use. And it you can use it to be teams activated, non activated teams. And then that what it does, instead of me having to go into each association, I know what teams I have to look at. See acti active uh, requirements not met. These are teams that are activated with all the requirements, teams that are not activated at all. We could do a search. Oh, I don't want all the leagues. But you can use a drop down. Since I'm the regional person, I can see all the teams that have not been activated. So when we get close to the first Monday in October and I start sending out emails to remind everybody, because the first thing you need to know is you need to activate your teams before they print an MPR. It's a mandatory play sheet. All football teams need to be activated before this will print. You will not see it otherwise. Cheerleading teams also have to be activated and they give you a separate deadline for the cheerleading teams. But all rosters need to be activated and completed by the first Monday in October. So generally what we do like a week before, we start sending out emails to remind you because I run this report on the region and I can see what teams have not been activated. And so I send it out to the league presidents. Just a reminder, you have all these teams that need to be activated. Nobody in it? All right, what association are you with? With what league? That's the new league, right? South Michigan, this one? Okay. All right. So this is these filters and the re reports that you can run are a nice, easy way to keep in charge and see what's going on. I use them all the time when people ask me stuff. I'm like, oh, let me see where you're at. And you said, tiny white cheer. All right, so here's what the, she started filling out her roster. So her team details is going to give you her information. It's going to tell you what size the team is. So here it is. So for a cheer roster, you have to make sure you designate what size. Are you small, medium, or large? The rule book will tell you based on how many girls you have on the squad what they are. The other thing that needs to be completed is what your level is. Level one, level two, level three. And that is based on their skill progression, what the girls are able to do. That is something that the cheer coordinators if you're all roster people, they're gonna tell you what they want the team to be labeled as, and you're just completing it. Football needs to be designated as D1, D2, D3. They always give you that information to do it. And then when you wanna roster your administrators, like I said, if you were picking out your team, a lot of times if you filter it, you can do a search here to add your coaches. Um, one of the things that you know you could recommend is this software is very good at keeping track of certifications. But the key is you need to enter it. So when your coach comes and gives you a copy of their coaching certificate, because I know a lot of leagues do request that, if you go in and start putting in their dates, you yourself can run a report and it'll tell you which coach's certificates expire. So you can kind of keep a track on it because you can say, the football certification for Mid-America and cheer are three years. Waikata is two years. USA football is one year. So USA football, you know that your coaches need to provide you that type of certification every year. Waikata is every two years and the Mid-America is every three years. And we, yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Um, I can show you when we, I can go to the reports tab and show you how to run it. But I mean, it's, it's a tool and also
Caddy likes to use it, tells people if they put in your GPA, you can also filter your GPAs by it too, right Caddy? Okay, she's not listening, okay. So it's a good feature, things are there to use. If you have issues or questions, you know, I can give you my email address. I think it's best, to, it's easier for me to do email because of the fact that I have something that I can look at. If it's something that I feel that I need to call you, if you include your phone number, because some questions I can answer very quickly and get off to you, and some questions I'll do a session with you, we could share the screen, and I can walk you through the screens and make it a little bit easier, because sometimes it's gonna be too hard for me to explain to you, and I prefer, you know, I could do screenshots, but you may have other questions, so I may just shoot you a call real quick and say, you know, what's the issue, how can I help you? Here's the, the roster player tab. And you can choose, you got more than one girl on the team? Did you? Okay. Here's the ready for activation tab. So as you can see, they pressed activate on this roster and the roster is not valid to be activated. And this is kind of perfect because this it gives you a big red dot and it tells you what the issue is. Unfortunately, girls need jersey numbers, right? Which is very crazy. Because does a cheerleader wear a jersey number? Why can't we default it to zero, right? So what you have to do in order to approve this roster, you need to go in and every cheerleader needs a zero, right? To get approved and get past that mistake. They also tell you that you're missing the GPA. So you have to go in and put it at the player. So when I was doing rosters, what's my minimum requirement to pass? That's right. So when I was rostering my kids, that I, always, I didn't always have a report card. So in order to allow me to get the kids rostered, I put in a 2.0. I know some people don't like that, but it helped me get through my system and it helped me register and roster my players, get my rosters done. I didn't have to worry about it. And then I would go back through and look at their scholastic eligibility. Yes. Did you get that? They're only going to the regional level? The other thing that this activation page will tell you is if you forgot a background check on one of your coaches. It was nice, the old software used to tell you you had too many coaches. That's why we went over in certification, how many coaches are allowed per roster. You have 10 slots allowed, but not all 10 slots can be coaches. So when I was doing book check and I asked the lady, how many coaches do you have? I have 10. I was like, yeah, there's no way. And she just looked at me, I, d I said, there's no way you can have 10 coaches. Because based on if you're football or cheer, it's one head coach, five assistant coaches for football, four assistant coaches for cheer. Then you have your student demos if you have them. Football allows you to do a coach trainee, right? So, when somebody tells me I have 10 coaches, I'm like, you have 10 spots, but you don't have 10 coaches. All right. Uh, 
I'm sorry. Technical difficulties. You can't see my face. You can't see my screen. It's a lot there. It likes my touch. All right. So this page is going to be important for you guys when you're doing this is to activate your rosters. And like I said, if you run that report, you as an association or a league person can run the report and see which rosters need to be activated, which ones do not. Once they're activated, they have a green check mark. That means you're good to go. Um, I know that some things were here about the mascots. And sometimes, even though the roster is approved, it'll tell you that that mascot is too young for that team. And why is that? Because the mascots are most of the time younger than the participants. So even though you get that message, that's a roster you'll have to reach out to me so that I can get it to activate completely. Or Christy, can you do those? That's me, right? Okay. So that's an email you shoot out to me. So my email is I M I. L E H A M 36 at gmail.com. I changed it. I M I L E H A M 36 at gmail.com. That way, all my pops won't. It comes to one email. Emma's and Mary, yes. You can, you're saying play with it? You can play with it because you can delete the team as long as you don't, because um, you'll have to, you could, you could practice adding coaches and everything. Then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to remove all your coaches, remove all your participants, because you can't delete a full team. So, and people have done that in the past, because normally when I send out an email at that last week of September to tell you, hey, you need to make sure all your rosters are approved, they'll have dummy teams with like two or three players. You just have to remember that you need to remove your coaches and your players, and then yes, you can delete the team. You're welcome. Any other questions? So you, what you want to do, like she said, is not activate it. You want to do everything that you can to get that team to be, because you want to get a feel for the software. It's pretty user friendly. I, does everybody agree? As long as you look at things, anything with a red red asterisk. Let's go to register a player. Oh, I, I don't have much more time. Patty's got her thing at eleven o'clock. They ran over on the other meeting, Brian. Yes, you did. You went over 15 minutes. No, no, you're, you're, you ran over 15 minutes. That's terrible. Okay. Who's whispering over there? I want to add a player. I want to add a player because I want to show you this. When you're adding a player, you're going to need their fir first name, last name, and birthday. Yes. What year with Northern Indiana? Yeah, Christy and I had a chat about that. She's going to. Yes. We just had a chat about that, and we discussed why that's happening. Because the young lady next to her asked her a question about that, and we figured out what the issue is. So you should be able to register. And what you do is you have the first name, last name, birth date. You hit next. Anything with a red asterisk needs to be completed. For a participant, you need their name, 
their age, their address. You're going to need a parent and guardian's name, and you're going to need an email address, right? For each participant, okay? A lot of times your registration form has that information that you need. Okay. I may have an answer. So you're saying you've been trying to read my handwriting? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I'm just. Yes. Okay, like a lot of people, I get a lot of junk email. So when people ask me for my email address, I'm very hesitant to give it out. Okay, I am. That's why I created the iMail a Gmail because I'm like that can all go there. I can filter, um, and I'm trying to eliminate stuff. Some people don't want to give you an email, but you do need an email to fit in, fill in. And also, we use those emails on different things. Like this year um, for the Scholastic Banquet due to the pandemic situation, we sent emails out to all our scholars. And we had over 103 emails that got rejected. So we had to, so we went through, because I know how to pull reports, I know how to do stuff, so I would pull a report, we would generate it, and we would try to fix the issue. You can make a recommendation that they print, because sometimes their printing is a little bit neater for the email address, but I can't guarantee it because I have very bad chicken scratch myself. So <laughs> that is correct too. Not everybody has an email, and nowadays with Gmail and Yahoo and them being free, it's kind of easy to get an email. But not everybody is tech savvy and wants that, so you can't. So the only thing that you can put in is none at none dot com. It's an email address. It gets you through your registration. They may not like my answer at the national office, but. Because, you know, as a business, what I do, too, is I need certain things for my. Did I lose it? I'm touching it. Let's go look at the age and weight matrix before I answer that question. Because that, that's the other thing that I do is when I'm doing my rosters and everything, I have the age and weight matrix that I print out from the national website so that as I'm looking at my teams, and when we're doing, you, you could spot check and say, yes, this kid fits the criteria, no, this kid does not. So we would check the age and weight matrix and see if those are the correct dates. But you still got the age matrix that'll tell you. And it gives you that little range and you can tell. And then if it's if the dates are wrong, you tell me and I can call them and have them update it. Okay. I yeah. So that and you're in two thousand twenty one? So that means they haven't moved the ages over. So that means I need to call Sports Connect and let them know that the ages are incorrect. So I'll have to call them, so I can call them, and then I can let Christy know that I've done it. Yes. Uh, PopWarner.com. It's the national office, the national website. And if you go to the national website, there's a section that has forms. So you want to download your age and weight matrix, because they should have, are the forms up yet? They are? OK. So normally they're not up, but the form should be up and that you want to print out your birth. So the things that I use when I'm doing my rosters, I print out a birthday checker and I print out the age and wage matrix. The birthday checker, because based on the level that your child is participating, it kind of gives you a, a range of the birthdays that you're looking for. And that's kind of what she was saying, that the birthdays are wrong. And that gives you an idea. And it's a very quick glance, because as you're doing a junior peewee team, 
you look at that matrix, it tells you my birthdays need to fit into this criteria, and very quickly you can say yes, 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 yes. This child fits that criteria. Um, it will also, the activation roster should kick that out. Should, right? Yes. Okay. So did we want to see the report? Is that what we wanted to see? Is that the other thing you wanted to see? Because I'm running a little over and Patty's going to yell. So a lot of people have asked this question, and I did reach out to Sports Connect because I have a duplicate player, okay? What they've recommended is that you can call them and they will do the mail merge for the family maintenance. We used to have that option before in the old software, and then because what they want to do is make sure they're not missing any history. So they prefer that if you call them, they can sit with you and go through it with you and help you do the maintenance because you want to pick the records that have the flowing history so you know where the child's been. Um, the other thing I'm going to show you very quickly, on the website there's a tab that's called the Help Center. The Help Center helps answer very quick questions like everything that I've provided onto the website is here on the Help Center. There is a section that's for Pop Warner that you can download and look at, and it'll show you, see Pop Warner resources. You can type in a question here, and if they have anything that'll fit in there, it'll pop up and it'll show you. And they're like PDFs, kind of what I um, provided before. It's getting started, login, about us, resources and information. So this is a quick place because when are you normally doing rosters? At 11 o'clock at night or one o'clock at night? Don't call me, because I'm not gonna answer. <laughs> but this is an area where you might be able to get an answer to that question, okay? And then the other thing I like to point out is they're there to help you out. So if you want, you can also get their phone number off the website. It gives you their hours of operation, I believe, it's like seven o'clock is the latest that they're open, but you can call them and they'll walk you through stuff too. They've, they're willing to do that. And if you wanted to do like, um, like we could do a WebEx, I do with people too, but they're also willing to do that too. Is it Nancy? Okay. All right, wh what do you want me to show you real quick before she? Yes, you can. No. I, I, okay, so they would, you can upload a birth certificate, but then again, it's a PDF. So that means you have to scan it to upload it. You know, that is, you know, I, I don't trust the cloud. Sorry, I don't. So I don't want to put stuff out there that is personal information. I'd rather keep it in my file folder or in my book. Yeah, that's just me. Some people like to utilize it and like to have the paperwork up there. That is a choice that you guys have to make per association, per league. You know, it's, I, I personally don't like it, but that's my opinion. It's not a requirement, we don't require that. You're required to have it in the book. We don't require you to upload it in the software. And people are getting hacked. Southwest and United Airlines just got hacked over the weekend. So, yeah. Yeah, that's where I was going next before Patty comes back. She's looking at me. So you're going to go to the report tab. And you can do the administrator report. And this is where you can change it. 
you can run a report here, but also you can customize a report too, which is kind of nice. Yes, Patty, I'm almost done. Yep. Um, Jamie and uh, Brian went to 1015. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Okay. So you could do additional reports. You can customize the report, which is very nice. It lets you pick your field if you want to do it. Like here, you could select a report type. You could do player. You can do, there's one in here that's certification, I thought. Um, what I can do is I can look that up and I can send out to everybody how to do it. How's that? Sound good? Okay, so I'm going to give you my phone number, but I'm going to recommend that you text me first because then that way, because I'm working from home, so there may be times I can call you if I'm not on a conference call or something. All right, you ready? 847-804-9900. Four eight, and you're welcome. And please, if you text me, give me your name and what association you're with, so I don't know who is texting me, just so I have an idea of where you're from, and that way I can return. Okay? I'm sorry. What? <laughs> she got that real quick. See? Yeah. So, but I just prefer if you text me first, because then that way, if I'm able to answer, I can answer you. If I need to call you, I'll call you. Okay, are we good? And I will do how to do the reports and send it to everybody. I can send it to the leagues and they can send it out. Good? You're welcome. Did you learn something new? Did you learn something new?